Well, good afternoon, Facebook family. And I want to welcome you again to another edition of Nash at Noon. I just want to thank you all for joining us and just thank you so much for making Ebenezer a part of your Thursday afternoon. I guess I'm getting pretty bad about this too. I don't even remember what day of the week it is. Well, this week and next, helping to help us prepare for Easter, we're going to be taking a look at the seven last words of Christ. See, last words are important. All right, they give us a final opportunity to speak to something that's truly important to us. And, and as we study Jesus' last words, the seven last phrases that he spoke on the cross, he shows us one thing very, very clearly. He died the exact same way that he lived, glorifying God and loving people. Now, Tuesday, we looked at the awesome forgiveness that Jesus offered from the cross when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And that forgiveness, again, extends to all of us because we're the ones that put him on the cross. It was our sin that put him there. Yesterday, we took a look at the amazing promise that the criminal on the cross, that Jesus made to that criminal on the cross when he said, Today, you will be with me in paradise. No waiting. Today, as soon as you leave this life, you will spend eternity with Jesus in heaven. What an awesome promise to an undeserving man. And I take heart in that because I also am an undeserving man of that promise. Today, we're going to be looking at the 19th chapter of John. And in the 19th chapter of John, we have... We have these words. I'm going to start reading in verse 25 and read through verse 27. It says, Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour... The disciple took her into his home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord, and we again just thank you so much for the many gifts and blessings you give us today and every day. Father, I just pray that, that you will help us speak to us, Lord, as we open your word. Help us, Lord, to better understand your message that you have for us this day. And I pray, Father, you will hide this man behind your cross. Lord, speak through these lips of clay, not my words, but yours. It's in your precious, holy, and amazing name we pray, Lord. Amen. So, this third phrase, it's important that we realize the scene that this phrase is set around. Now, we've talked at length, and really most of the gospel um, recollections of the cross speak at length, to the mockers, to those who were against Jesus, who were gathered around the cross, who were hurling insults at him, or the soldiers themselves who were actually inflicting this physical harm on him. But we need to remember that there are a faithful few that are there with him during this time. First, there's his mother, his mother Mary. Of course she's there. I mean, her son was in trouble, so mom is there. That's just how it works. But also it's a fulfillment of prophecy. So much of what happens on the cross, most of what happens on the cross is the direct fulfillment of prophecy. Now this prophecy comes from the New Testament, and this prophecy comes days after Jesus was born. Over in Luke 2.35, a man named Simeon prophesied this over Mary, over Joseph, and over the baby Jesus when they took him to the temple to dedicate him to the Lord. And he said, And a sword will pierce your own soul. This is Simeon talking to Mary. And I know physically the, 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 the cross hurt Christ more than anybody physically. But emotionally, you know Mary had to be hurting. She was there. Also, Luke 2.41 tells us every year his parents traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. This crucifixion occurs during the Passover festival. So Mary is in Jerusalem for the Passover festival. 
But Jesus' mother wasn't there by herself. She had some friends along. First, she had her sister, Salome, who's also the mother of James and John, two of the inner circle of the three disciples that were really Jesus' cousins. Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. So those four women were joined by one man, and that's the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, this is John. This is the author of the Gospel of John that we just read out of. And maybe he, he refers to, him, to himself as the disciple who Jesus loved five times total in the Gospel of John. And, and maybe it's just kind of, you know, he doesn't really want to brag on himself. Maybe it's kind of a sense of modesty that, that keeps him from naming his own name. But in reality, he has something to be proud of because he is the only disciple of Jesus Christ that truly sticks with him to the end. But it wasn't the end, was it? But John was faithful. So it's to this small group that Jesus speaks his third word from the cross. He looks at his mother and he says, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, that's John, here is your mother. You know, to our ears, this, this sounds kind of weird. He's referring to his mom as woman. But to our ears, this does sound kind of cold and strange. But the reality is in first century Palestine, in the, in the time period that this takes place, this is a common way for a man to address a woman. But it's still unusual because usually this is not a way a son would address his mother. Many scholars believe that Jesus used this language, he used these specific words simply because it's standard language for a legal transaction. Well, what kind of a legal transaction needs to be taking place at this time, you might ask? Well, as Mary's firstborn son, Jesus had the legal responsibility for his mother's welfare when she becomes a widow. And we know Jesus' earthly father, Joseph, died before, presumably before Jesus' ministry. And so we know Mary is a widow at this point. Therefore, Jesus is legally responsible for her well-being. And as a J good Jewish son, Jesus legally passes this obligation to another, to John. And John takes this very seriously. Because we read John's response, or, or at least what happened because of this promise. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. Jesus is appointing John to fulfill his duties in his stead, to care for his mother. Now, what, what does this word from the cross teach us about Jesus? Well, it's yet another example of the extent of Jesus' love for others. And in this case, his mother. I mean, I want you to think about it for a moment. Jesus is dying. Jesus is in agony, gasping for each breath. But he looks down to the ground and he sees there his mother. The one who comforted him throughout all of his childhood. I mean, think about childhood cuts and bruises and teases and taunts. Where do we go for comfort in these situations? We go to our mother. Jesus was no different. I'm sure at some point he fell and skinned his knee in. Where did he go crying to? His mother. Because remember, Jesus was 100% human. When he was a boy, those were the arms that he ran to in order to find comfort. But now, as he sees her at the foot of the cross, heartbroken, weeping, inconsolable, his heart goes out to her. And rather than being consumed by an understandable concern for his own welfare, he is touched deeply out of concern for her. You see, Mary is a widow. And in, in, in this day and age, in this culture of first century Palestine, being a widow was really a tough life. It was hard. And it was getting ready to get harder. Because in not too much longer, not only is Mary going to be a widow, but Mary is also going to be the mother of a child killed by crucifixion. 
and only those who are truly evil in the sight of the Roman Empire are executed in that manner. So there is an additional stigma with that besides just the life of a widow that's hard enough. Life is getting ready to be difficult, and Jesus wants her to be taken care of. Now, what are we to learn from this third word from the cross? First of all, love for family. The Bible is very clear. We must love our parents no matter what. Now, I know there's some people out there that when you hear a phrase like that, you, you, you immediately shrink back or shake your head or, or bow your head and think, yeah, but Nash, you don't understand what my parents have done. You're right, I, I don't. I, I am blessed I grew up in a wonderful, godly household. I'm not saying my parents and I never had any disagreements. Of course we did. I was a dumb teenager. There were lots of disagreements. But I always knew, and even to this day still know, my parents love me. But I also understand not everybody is blessed to have that kind of background. Sometimes parents misunderstand or disapprove of decisions we make. and Well, that hurts. Jesus, too, felt the hurt of disapproval from his family, even his own mother. John 2, 1 through 11, records Jesus' first miracle. And if you remember, that takes place at a wedding banquet. And just a social travesty had taken place. The, the host was out of wine, and this was just a major league faux pas. And so Mary goes to her son, Jesus, and says, fix it. And how does Jesus respond to Mary? He says, my time has not yet come. But what did he do? He did what his mother asks of him. Over in Mark 3, Jesus' family thought he was out of his mind. So much so that they went to take charge of him. And then over in John 7, verse 5 says, for not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus' family, other than his mother, his, all of his siblings thought he was nuts, thought he had lost his mind. Not that he was the Savior at this point. Whether they understand us or even approve of us, whether we can even trust them at this point, because I know some parents behave themselves and make, make decisions that, that really disqualify them of trust for a time being. It doesn't matter. Because Exodus 20, 21 tells us to honor your father and your mother. It doesn't say to honor them if... It just says, honor your father and mother. Christ-powered love can help heal the hurts from our families. But if we're going to operate our lives in Christ-powered love, we need to love our parents. That's the first thing I think this word from the cross teaches us. The second thing is a responsibility for our family. We are responsible for our family obligations. Now, I know this kind of sounds like a, well, duh, Nash. Of course we're responsible for our parents. But in some ways it is that obvious, but in some ways it can get very complicated depending on the circumstances. See, Jesus was very clear about our commitments and who our commitments should be made to and what priority level those commitments should each have. He was very clear our primary number one con con Concern. Our number one commitment was to him and him alone. To two clear examples of this. Matthew 10, 37 and 38. The person who loves the father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The person who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Again, Luke 14, 26 says it even clearer. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, is, is that really telling us that we're to hate these people? No, it's, it's a literary device called hyperbole. All right, you're making an over-exaggerated statement in order to prove a point. What he is saying is our love for God should be so strong and should be so number one that it almost looks like we don't like people in number two. Almost. 
having said all that, just because we're Christians and in our relationship with Christ comes first, that doesn't mean that we're absolved of any responsibility for our family relationships. Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 5, 8, but if anyone does not provide for his own, that is his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So there's no way Paul can say you're denying the faith if you don't love, if you don't put, take care of your own household. And say, that means I don't need to love my parents. It, it just doesn't work. Sometimes, when we're immature believers, we, we kind of take rash actions towards our families that really weren't filled with God's love. But our priority is clear. Number one, Christ. Way number one, Christ. Number two, family. And number three is our work for the Lord. Now, during these times, during these times of difficulty, during the scare of this COVID-19 virus, I think God is helping us, helping many of us at least, put our priorities in order. Because there are a lot of people in our world today that can't go to work. They've been quarantined. They've been sent home from work for one reason or another. So how are you going to use this time? What are you going to do with all of this time you find, I, I propose you invest this time in those three primary responsibilities. One is your relationship with God. And I know you might say, Nash, it's Thursday afternoon and I'm watching, watching a devotional moment, so you're kind of preaching to the choir. Well, I was a music minister for an awful long time, so I'm used to preaching to the choir. Yes, and I appreciate it, but we need to make that a priority. There are all kinds of tools that we have in the world that we live in today that we can use in order to invest in our relationship with God. Do so. Not only during this time where we have that spare time, but once life gets back to whatever normal is going to look like, we need to remember that relationship still comes first. Our second relationship is our family. I know I've heard a lot of people seen it on Facebook and seen a lot of memes on Facebook talking about how too much family time is sometimes not a good thing. This is a time for us to invest in those relationships to really truly get to know our family on that deep, intimate level. Because I think it's really sad when spending time with your family is a chore. But the reality is we only get that way when we don't spend enough time with them to know them. Fix that now. God has given us a wonderful opportunity to do just that. But remember our third priority, and that's our work for God. There are so many opportunities to serve God right now. There, there are older folks that, that really absolutely do not need to be getting out in this stuff. Go run some errands for them if you're younger, or if you have a strong immune system. Still be careful. Still practice social distancing. But at the same time, if you're going to the grocery store for you, call some people who don't need to be out and about and say, hey, I'm going to the grocery store. Can I pick something up for you while I'm there? Look for opportunities to serve. And if you are one of those people that really doesn't need to be out and about in this, you might be thinking to yourself, well, how in the world can I serve the kingdom if I'm confined to my home? Pray. That is the most powerful tool any of us have. Use this time, redeem this time by praying. Pray for the virus to go away. Pray for the medical personnel, all of them, from the doctors all the way down to the folks mopping the floor and everybody in between. Pray for the workers at these essential businesses, at these grocery stores, at these hardware stores, the, the people that are helping us keep life as normal as possible. Pray for our first responders, our police officers, our, our EMT folks, you know, people who don't always have a choice of where they go. They go where they're needed, and they serve us. We need to serve them by praying for them. Pray for their safety. Pray that they wouldn't catch this virus, and pray for their families. But most importantly, pray that simple prayer that we talked about Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but yours. Not only pray it, but live it. If God tells you to do it, he's going to bring you through it. So be obedient to God in all we do. 
So how do we reconcile this primary commitment of Jesus to our responsibility to our families? Well, honestly, sometimes with great difficulty, but always with lots of prayer and discernment. God will give us the wisdom to work this out if we just listen and obey. See, here at the end of his life, Jesus shows us a tender love for his mother. A mother who had sometimes misunderstood him. He takes his responsibility to his family very seriously. And so should we. So go love your parents. Honor your parents. And honoring your parents applies for the rest of your life, even if they have gone on before you. Honor our parents in everything that we do and serve God with everything that we have. I think that is what Jesus is trying to teach us with this third word from the cross. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord, and we again just thank you. Thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for the gift of godly parents. And Father, I just pray a special prayer for those who were not blessed to grow up under godly parents. Speak to them clearly. Help them know what they need to do. Help them to break that cycle and be godly parents themselves. Help us, Lord, to, to honor our father and our mother, even if there have been disagreements, even if that relationship has been strained. Help us, Lord, to put all that behind us and simply love one another with your love. And Father, help us to love you and serve you with everything that we have. We love you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. It's in your holy, wonderful, and amazing name we pray, Lord. Amen. Thank you very much for joining us today and look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Have a blessed day.